and welcome to the Firm Foundation Series. My name is Pastor Dale Yancey. I've got my uh, cup of coffee, and you can grab yours or whatever else you want to drink. And join me here for lesson number 17, which is God Destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. As always, you can go to our website. The address is right there on the screen, foundationstudy.weebly.com. And there at our website, you can download notes for today's lesson, as well as view previous lessons all the way back to lesson number one. Okay? So check it out foundationstudy.weebly.com and tell your family and friends and co-workers about this uh, series and about our website so that they too can get in on the Firm Foundation series. Well listen, we live in a society today that disdains any standards of morality and righteousness and for some that will make today's lesson somewhat uncomfortable and hard to swallow. You see the story of God's judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah stands as a clear testimony to God's unwavering truth. You see, what makes our study today so timely is that this passage of Scripture talks about the kind of sin that was prevalent in these cities, which is homosexuality, and every other kind of sexual sin was prevalent there as well. And that same sin is flourishing in our day and age. And many excuse their sin as a chosen lifestyle. You see, the gay lifestyle and agenda has been accepted, and it's now promoted daily on television as well as in the media. And really, it's being forced upon businesses as well. In a Pew Research poll in 2001, Americans opposed same-sex marriage by 57% to 35% margin. Since then, support for same-sex marriage has steadily grown. And based on recent polling here in 2015, a majority of Americans, 55% support same-sex marriage, compared with 39% who oppose it. And now we've opened a whole new can of worms with a transgender issue. And you actually have schools that are now designating gender-neutral bathrooms. I mean, have we ever lived in such a confused society where almost anything goes, and because of political correctness, you can't even express your opinion or pass judgment, or you'll be sent off to a sensitivity session where you're made to be more open and accepting of deviant and twisted behavior. And while all these various lifestyles and behaviors may be popular and may be the accepted norm today, God has not changed. And God does not change his mind based upon uh, Pew Research polls or on popularity or because of lobbying or even threats. You see, God's righteous standards don't change based upon the whims and dictates of our society or our leaders. I've known individuals who are gay and they renounced the gay lifestyle and there was a change in their life. And I've also known those who struggled and said that they couldn't change. So I'm not here today to pass judgment. Uh, and I'm not here today to condemn anyone. I'm here just to bring a study here in the book of Genesis. I want us to look at what God says in his word, which sadly some gay theologians have twisted to make it fit their agenda and lifestyle. You know, there's a scripture that says, let God's word be true, let every man be a liar. And really... Even if you don't agree with it, I would hope that you want to approach God's word honestly and really know what it says rather than massaging the scripture and twisting it like some theologians have done. Without twisting the scripture, I would think you'd want to know exactly what the scripture really does say. That's a starting point. And then you can wrestle with it. You can deal with it. Uh, and you can go before God and call out for God's help and mercy in your time of need. Whether you're gay or straight, we all need God's help and mercy. Now, one of the great lessons of this story is that you and I, we need to be mindful of the choices that we make. You see, Abraham chose to believe God, and God is still pouring out blessings upon the descendants of Abraham. Those who, like Abraham, believe God, but Lot, he, chose, he made a choice that unnecessarily placed him and his family in the midst of a perverted, godless environment. And that same scenario is what we have today, where many go from one sex partner to another. And instead of having lives of meaning and purpose, the focus is on sensuality, on sexuality, on the physical, and not on the true character or soul or spirit of a person. And the sad fact is that sin leaves a horrible trail of pain, sorrow, wasted lives, destruction, and death. But before we go any further, let's review last week's lesson, which is, Lesson 16, God chose, called, and guided Abram. Question number one, did God abandon his plan to send a deliverer for mankind because they rebelled against God and built the Tower of Babel? No. Two, 
What did God do to ensure that the, that the Deliverer would be born into the world? God chose and called Abraham to be the ancestor of the Deliverer. And three, what did God tell Abraham to do? God told him to leave his own country and go to the place to which God had promised to lead him. And four, how many children did Abraham and Sarai have when the Lord told them to go to a different country? They didn't have any children. Five, and what did God promise Abraham? Well, God said that Abraham's descendants would be a great nation. And God promised that he would protect and prosper Abraham so that he would become an important man. And that through him, others would receive great blessing and help. And C, God said he would prosper those who helped Abram, but that he would bring evil on anyone who treated Abraham wrongly. And D, God also said that all the nations and tribes in the world would receive God's help and blessing through a certain descendant of Abraham. All right, six. Who would this descendant of Abram be? He would be the deliverer, the Messiah, the one who would overcome Satan and make it possible for people to be one with God, to have a relationship with God. Seven, God spoke directly to Abram, but how does God speak to people today? Well, primarily he speaks to us through the Bible, but he also speaks to us through the gifts of the Spirit, which are words of knowledge, prophecy, also through dreams and visions. I mean, in the Middle East, there are just tons of Muslims that are coming to know the Messiah because of God giving them dreams and visions. Well, eight, did God choose Abraham because of Abraham wasn't a sinner? No, all people are sinners. Nine, and how did Abraham come to God to worship him? He came the same way Abel, Seth, and Noah had come. They came the way that God told them. And ten, what did Abraham do when God gave him the promise? He believed God. He left his own country, and he went where God guided him. Eleven. What similarities do you see in Abel, Seth, Enoch, Noah, and Abram? Well, they believed God, and they came to God in the way that God asked them to come. They obeyed God. And 12. Why did Lot move away from Abram and live down on the plain near Sodom and Gomorrah? And the answer is because Abram and Lot had so many sheep, so many animals, there wasn't sufficient grass and room for them to live together. And Lot moved to the plain because it was well watered and it had, had much more grass for his animals. And 13, what benefit will riches be to people when they die uh, and go to everlasting punishment? Well, their riches will not be of any benefit to them at all. And 14, who saw the wicked things the people of Sodom and Gomorrah did? The answer is God did. God's, God sees everything. God knows everything. Well, the introduction for today's lesson is, it's gonna, this lesson is going to introduce some really important issues. Like, what does God consider to be righteousness? And how can anyone be counted righteous in God's sight? And does God care if people choose to live an immoral life? Is homosexuality really a sin? And the Bible will answer these questions very clearly. And this story that we're going to study today reminds us of what happened in Noah's day. And it makes us think about what's happening right now in our society. After Lot left Abram, the Lord spoke to Abram and promised once again to give him all the land of Canaan. And let's read at Genesis chapter 13, verse 14. After Lot left, the Lord said to Abram, Look north, south, east, and west of where you are. I will give you all the land you see. I will give it to you and your descendants for an indefinite period of time. I will also give you as many descendants as the dust of the earth. If anyone could count the dust of the earth, then he could count your descendants. So go, walk back and forth across the entire land because I'm giving it to you. And you can see here on the map the area of Canaan. This is the area that we're talking about. This is the area that God promised to give to Abraham and told him, just walk the land. And everywhere that your feet uh, tread upon, I'm giving it to you. All this land. And that's uh, the land of Canaan, which we now know to be Israel today. Now, how many stars can you see in the sky on a dark cloudless night. Well one night God took Abram outside of his tent and he told him to look up and see if he could number the stars. And right then and there God promised Abram even before he had one child that his descendants would be as many as the stars. Let's read Genesis 15 starting at verse 5. He took Abram outside and said, Now look up at the sky and count the stars if you're able to count them. He also said to him, that's how many descendants you're going to have. 
And then Abram believed the Lord. And the Lord regarded that faith to be his approval of Abram. And the theme here is that man must have faith in order to please God and to be saved. So Abraham believed God. Now what God had promised would have seemed impossible. Abraham and Sarai, they'd been married for many years and now they're old and they've never been able to have a child. But Abraham trusted in God. He trusted God to give him a child and to send the, the deliverer to, as one of his descendants. Therefore, because Abraham believed God, the Bible says that God accepted him as if he had no sin at all. See, Abraham was a sinner, just like you and me, but because of his trust in God, he was accepted by God as though he was perfectly right, as though he was perfectly righteous. We read in Genesis 15, verse 6, And Abraham believed the Lord, and the Lord counted him as righteous because of his faith. Now, what is righteousness? Well, the root word for righteousness is right. See, the Bible says God counted it to him, or he gave Abraham credit for being right and acceptable to God. But you see, Abraham was a sinner. Well, what did God find in Abraham that would cause God to credit Abraham with righteousness? And why should God accept Abraham, a sinner? Well, the only reason why God credited righteousness to Abraham was that Abraham believed God. And here I have this visual. Abram believed God, and God counted it or credited it to him for righteousness. Now you might say that though Abram's bank account with God was in the red because of his sin, God put righteousness into Abram's account. And this righteousness given to him as a gift from God was the reason that Abram was fully acceptable to God. Now why did God do this for him? It's because Abram believed God. It's that simple. He believed God. He believed what God said, what God told him. He believed the promises of God. Abram knew that he could not save himself from his sins, but he believed that God was going to send a deliverer who would be able to save him from Satan and from death. And the theme here is that God is everywhere all the time and that God knows everything. We read here in Genesis 15, starting at verse 13, Then the Lord said to Abram, you can be sure that your descendants will be strangers in a foreign land where they'll be oppressed as slaves for 400 years. And again, like 500 years before this even happened, God is telling Abram that his descendants are going to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. They will be oppressed. But God goes on to say, but I will punish the nation that enslaves them. And in the end, they will come away with great wealth. And as for you, you will die in peace and you'll be buried at a ripe old age. And after four generations, your descendants will return here to this land, for the sins of the Amorites do not yet warrant their destruction. So you see, God knew all that would happen to Abram's descendants long before they were even born. Now, do you know what's going to happen next week? Or in ten years' time? What about uh, one or two hundred years from now? No one knows. And no one has the answers to the questions except for God, you see. He alone knows all about the future. He, he alone knows all about your future and my future. The Bible says he has the very hairs on our head numbered. All right, So God knows everything about you or I, all the intricate details of your life. And he knows what's going to happen in your life tomorrow, next week, next month, next year. Let's read Genesis 17, verse 1. When Abraham was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am El Shaddai. God Almighty, serve me faithfully and live a blameless life. I will make a covenant with you, by which I'll guarantee to give you countless descendants. At this, Abraham fell face down on the ground, and then God said to him, This is my covenant with you. I will make you the father of a multitude of nations. What's more, I am changing your name. It will no longer be Abram. Instead, you'll be called Abraham, for you will be the father of many nations. So God again spoke to Abram when he was 99 years old. God changed Abram's name to Abraham because God promised that he would become the father of many nations. Abram means exalted father, and the name Abraham means father of a multitude of children. Now see, God's promise that Abraham and Sarah would have a son. The theme here is that God communicates with man. We read in Genesis 17, verse 15, Then God said to Abram, Regarding Sarai, your wife, her name will no longer be Sarai. 
From now on, her name will be Sarah, and I will bless her and give you a son from her. Yes, I will bless her richly, and she'll become the mother of many nations. Kings of nations will be among her descendants. And the theme here is that God is all-powerful. The theme also is that man needs God. We read in Genesis 17, verse 17, Then Abram bowed down to the ground, but he laughed to himself in disbelief. How could I become a father at the age of a hundred, he thought. And how could Sarah have a baby when she's 90 years old? I mean, it seemed impossible that Abram and Sarah would have a son. See, Abram would be a hundred years old and Sarah would be 90 years old. But the promise did not depend upon their human frailty. You see, it's God who made the promise and he's almighty. He's the God who can do the impossible. He can do anything. Now we come to D, God's attitude towards Sodom and Gomorrah. And the theme here is that man's a sinner. He needs God, and he's helpless to save himself. The theme also is that God is everywhere all the time, and he knows everything. Now we're going to read about an amazing encounter Abraham has with three visitors who know all about Abraham and Sarah. So join me in reading here at Genesis 18, starting at verse 1, okay? The Lord appeared again to Abram near the oak grove belonging to Mamre. One day Abram was sitting at the entrance to his tent during the hottest part of the day. He looked up and he noticed three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them. He welcomed them, bowing low to the ground. My Lord, he said, if it pleases you, stop here for a while. Rest in the shade of this tree while water is brought to wash your feet. And since you have honored your servant with this visit, let me prepare some food to refresh you before you continue on your journey. All right, they said, do as you've said. So Abraham ran back to the tent and he said to Sarah, Hurry, get three large measures of your best flour, knead it into dough and bake some bread. Then Abraham ran out to the herd and chose a tender calf and gave it to a servant who quickly prepared it. When the food was ready, Abraham took some yogurt and milk and the roasted meat and he served it to the men. As they ate, Abraham waited on them in the shade of the trees. Where is Sarah, your wife? The visitors asked. Well, she's inside the tent, Abram replied. Then one of them said, I will return to you about this time next year, and your wife, Sarah, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening to this conversation from the tent. Abram and Sarah were both very old by this time, and Sarah was long past the age of having children. So she laughed silently to herself and said, how could a worn-out woman like me enjoy such a pleasure, especially when my master, my husband, is also so old? And then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh? Why did she say, Can an old woman like me have a baby? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return about this time next year, and Sarah will have a son. Now Sarah was afraid, so she denied it, saying, I didn't laugh. But the Lord said, Oh, no, you did laugh. Then the men got up from their meal, and they looked out towards Sodom. And as they left, Abraham went with them to send them on their way. Should I hide my plan from Abraham, the Lord asked? For Abraham will certainly become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth will be blessed through him. I have singled him out so that he will direct his sons and their families to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just. And then I'll do for Abraham all that I have promised. So the Lord told Abram, here's what he said, he said, I have heard a great outcry from Sodom and Gomorrah because their sin is so flagrant. I'm going down to see if their actions are as wicked as I've heard. If not, I want to know. The other men approached and headed towards Sodom, but the Lord remained with Abraham. Abraham approached him and said, Will you sweep away both the righteous and the wicked? I mean, suppose you find 50 righteous people living there in the city. Will you still sweep it away and not spare it for their sakes? Surely you wouldn't do such a thing, destroying the righteous along with the wicked. Why, you would be treating the righteous and the wicked exactly the same. Surely you wouldn't do that. Should not the judge of all the earth do what is right? And the Lord replied, If I find fifty righteous people in Sodom, I'll spare the entire city for their sake. Then Abraham spoke again, Since I've begun... Let me speak further to my Lord, even though I am but dust and ashes. Suppose there are only 45 righteous rather than 50. Will you destroy the whole city for the lack of five? And the Lord said, I'll not destroy it if I find 45 righteous people there. 
Then Abraham pressed his request even further. Well, suppose there are only 40. And the Lord replied, I will not destroy it for the sake of 40. Oh, please don't be angry, my Lord, Abraham pleaded. Let me speak. Suppose only 30 righteous people are found. And the Lord replied, I'll not destroy it if I find 30. Then Abraham said, since I've dared to speak to the Lord, let me continue. Suppose there are only 20. And the Lord replied, then I'll not destroy it for the sake of 20. Finally, Abraham said, Lord, please don't be angry with me if I speak one more time. Suppose only 10 are found there. And the Lord replied, then I'll not destroy it for the sake of 10. When the Lord had finished his conversation with Abraham, he went on his way, and Abraham returned to his tent. Two of these three visitors are angels, and the third, the one whom Abraham bargains with in terms of asking God to spare even ten righteous in Sodom and Gomorrah, that third person is the Lord himself, the Messiah, the Deliverer, Jesus of Nazareth. And here I have a, a map showing you the probable location of Sodom and Gomorrah. We think that it was located right next to the Dead Sea in that area. Now, you'll remember that Lot had moved down near these two wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, even though there are many people in the world at the time, God saw everything that the people of Sodom and Gomorrah were doing, everything that they did, and he heard everything that they said. And the theme here is that God is loving, merciful, and gracious. And God is supreme and sovereign. And God is holy and righteous. He demands death as a payment for sin. You see, God had been displeased with these wicked people and in these two cities for a long time, long before Lot ever moved there. For a long time, the Lord had been patient with their inhabitants, but now he decided that he could tolerate it no longer, that they could no longer escape the judgment of God. And as we just read, Abraham interceded for the people of Sodom and Gomorrah, asking God to spare Sodom and Gomorrah if even ten righteous could be found. Sad to say, there are not even ten righteous in all of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, do you remember how patiently God waited for the people to repent in the days of Noah when he lived? I mean, God gave them 120 years to repent. But the time came when God finally decided and said, Enough is enough that I've given you enough, a sufficient time to repent. And not one of those who refused to, go, to agree with God escaped his punishment there uh, in the flood. God is sovereign and supreme. He doesn't ask anyone what he should do. When he decides to punish sinners, there's no one that can stop him. Now, think about this. Because God doesn't immediately punish sin, it may seem like God overlooks sin. But nevertheless, he'll eventually punish all sin. No one can escape from God. He's our almighty creator, and he sees and he'll punish the sin of every single person. Now, E. God's angels come to Sodom. Let's read here Genesis 19, starting at verse 1. And that evening the two angels came to the entrance of the city of Sodom. And Lot was sitting there. And when he saw them, he stood up to meet them. And then he welcomed them, and he bowed with his face to the ground. My lords, he said, come to my home to wash your feet and be my guests for the night. You may then get up early in the morning and be on your way again. Oh no, they replied, we'll just spend the night out here in the city square. But Lot insisted, so at last they went home with him. And Lot prepared a feast for them, complete with fresh bread made without yeast, and they ate. Now, where's Lot at this time? Remember, previously, Lot chose to live near the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. And now we see that he's actually moved right in, and he's living among these wicked people. And that's so often what happens with sin. You know, sin entices you, and it draws you and pulls you in. And so because he's living close to Sodom and Gomorrah, he eventually finds himself moving closer and closer to where he's finally now living right in the middle of the city. Now, who were his visitors and why did they come? Well, these were two of God's good angels who had not followed Satan. And God sent them to Sodom for a special purpose. He sent these angels to warn Lot and his family about what was going to happen. The theme here is that God is everywhere all the time. And God knows everything. You see, God knew that Lot believed him, even though Lot lived among the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. God knows everything. And the Bible gives us more insight into the sin of Sodom. 
And we read in Ezekiel 16, verse 49, it says, Sodom's sins were pride, gluttony, and laziness, while the poor and needy suffered outside her door. So she was proud and committed detestable sins, so I wiped her out, as you have seen. You see, these people were proud. They were gluttons, and they didn't care about the needs of others. And now let's look at the F, which is the sinfulness of the Sodomites. And the theme here is that man is a sinner. He needs God. He's helpless to save himself. And we read in Genesis 19, verse 4, But before they retired for the night, all the men of Sodom, young and old, came from all over the city, and they surrounded Lot's house. And they shouted to Lot, Where are the men who came to spend the night with you? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. So Lot stepped outside to talk to them, shutting the door behind him. Please, my brothers, he begged, don't do such a wicked thing. Once you consider this, basically the men of Sodom wanted to rape Lot's guests. What a sad and sickening passage this is. But God has put it here for us to read. Stop and think. Is our society any better? The word sodomy is still in our language because the sin of sodomy is still in our midst. You see, God's only plan for sex was that it was to be a special bond between a man and his wife and the means for them to have children. The unnatural, out-of-control, selfish passions that plague Sodom, they're still raging today in our society. Now, there's some twisted theologians who say that the men of Sodom only wanted to get acquainted. You see, that they, they say the word no is they just wanted to, to get acquainted with these guests of Lot's and, and just get to know them and have a conversation with them. But the word no in the Greek means to know sexually. I mean, come on, think about it. Why would all the men of the city bang on Lot's door just to have a conversation with Lot's guests? That doesn't make any sense at all. Yet that's what some liberal gay theologians have said is going on here. The Bible says that Adam knew his wife, Eve, and that they had a son. So we realize that God's use of the word no means to have sex. It means to know someone intimately, physically. Now, Lot's earlier choice of the best land appears quite different now in light of this awful scene. If God had not sent his angels, what a horrible end Lot and his two daughters would have faced. But the Bible tells us that Lot believed God, and because of that, God rescued them. Now, let's look at G. Lot, his wife, and his daughters are rescued out of Sodom. The theme here is, man is a sinner. He needs God, and he's helpless to save himself. Now Lot does what seems to be a strange thing. He offers up his two daughters to the men of Sodom. The question that arises is, what kind of father would offer his daughters to a sex-crazed, ravenous crowd? And the answer is, Lot. But some consider his offer to be noble, an act of self-sacrifice, and the ultimate hospitality, protecting his guests by being willing to sacrifice his daughters. Others, however, have viewed Lot's actions as cowardly. I mean, he should have protected his guests as well as his daughters. Well, whatever Lot's motives for offering his daughters, the crowd refuses the offer, and they move toward the door, trying to force their way into his house. And now let's read Genesis 19, verse 10. But the two angels reached out, they pulled Lot into the house, they bolted the door, and then they blinded all the men, young and old, who were at the door of the house so that they gave up trying to get inside. Meanwhile, the angels questioned Lot. Do you have any other relatives here in the city, they asked? Get them out of this place, your sons-in-law, sons, daughters, or anyone else, for we are about to destroy the city completely. The outcry against this place is so great that it has reached the Lord, and he has sent us to destroy it. So Lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiancés. He said to them, Quick! Get out of the city. The Lord's about to destroy it. But the young men, his daughter's fiancés, they thought he was just joking. At dawn the next morning, the angels became insistent. Hurry, they said to Lot. Take your wife and your two daughters who are here. Get out right now, or you'll be swept away in the destruction of the city. When Lot still hesitated, the angels seized his hand and the hands of his wife and two daughters, and they rushed them to safety outside the city because the Lord was merciful. When they were safely out of the city, one of the angels ordered, Run for your lives, and don't look back or stop anywhere in the valley. Escape to the mountains, or you too will be swept away. 
So we see the angels intervene by striking the crowd with blindness. And then turning to Lot, the angels tell him to gather his family and escape from the city because the Lord is going to destroy it. Now, God did not save Lot and his wife and daughters because they were good. You see, Lot was not living a wicked life like the people of Sodom, but Lot too, just like everyone else, like everyone in Sodom and Gomorrah, Lot too was a sinner. He was born a sinner. However, Lot agreed with God that he was a sinner and he trusted in God's mercy. And the theme here is that man must have faith in order to please God and to be saved. You see, Lot believed the promises given to Adam and to his uncle Abraham about the coming deliverer. And the theme here is that God is loving, merciful, and gracious. See, God's angels led Lot out before the wicked cities were destroyed. And God always saves those who agree with him and trust in him. And Abel agreed with God and trusted in him, and God accepted Abel. Noah agreed with God, and he trusted in him, and God saved Noah and his family from the flood. And Lot agreed with God and trusted in him, and God delivered him before Sodom was destroyed. Now, H, God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. The theme here is God is holy and righteous. He demands death as a payment for sin. Let's read Genesis 19, verse 24. Then the Lord rained down fire and burning sulfur from the sky on Sodom and Gomorrah. He, utter, he utterly destroyed them, along with the other cities and villages of the plain, wiping out all the people and every bit of vegetation. And I have a picture here that kind of shows you what that might have looked like. Now, once Lot was safely outside the city, God destroys Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, God hates sin. And just as he destroyed the world by a flood the first time in the days of Noah, now he destroys these wicked people by fire. And we read in 2 Peter 2, 4 through 9, God calls the destruction of these cities an example of what is going to happen to ungodly people. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 4. You see, for God did not spare even the angels who sinned. He threw them into hell, into gloomy pits of darkness, where they are being held until the day of judgment. And God did not spare the ancient world. Except for Noah and the seven others in his family, Noah warned the world of God's righteous judgment. So God protected Noah when he destroyed the world of ungodly people with a vast flood. Later, God condemned the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Gomorrah, and he turned them into heaps of ashes. He made them an example of what would happen to ungodly people. But God also rescued Lot out of Sodom because he was a righteous man who was sick of the shameful immorality of the wicked people around him. Yes, Lot was a righteous man who was tormented in his soul by the wickedness he saw and heard day in, day out. So you see, the Lord knows how to rescue godly people from their trials, even while keeping the wicked under punishment until the day of final judgment. The theme here is that God is faithful. He never changes. You see, God is still the same today. God has not changed. He still sees and hates sin. No one can escape his judgment. Now let's look at I. Lot's wife looked back. The theme here is God is holy and righteous. He demands death as a payment for sin. And let's read Genesis nineteen twenty six. But Lot's wife looked back as she was following behind him, and she turned into a pillar of salt. So, when the angels took Lot, his wife, and two daughters out of Sodom, they told them not to look back, but to run to the mountains. But Lot's wife disobeyed. And here's like a picture of what she might have looked like once she was turned into a pillar of salt. See, God knew what was in the heart of Lot's wife. Lot's wife was a lot like Cain. She didn't trust God. And God knew why she looked back. She looked back because she liked the sinful ways of the people of Sodom. And she didn't want to leave her home and all of her friends. And she was very foolish to ignore God's warning because when she looked back, God turned her into a pillar of salt. And the theme here is that God is faithful, and he never changes. Now consider this. If you and I, if we get angry at someone, we may threaten lots of things. But after a while, we eventually forget. But you see, God doesn't threaten to punish and then forget. He's always the same. He remembers and keeps his promises to bless those who trust in him and to punish those who disobey him. See, God never forgets about sin until it's paid in full. And the punishment for sin is death. It's separation from God 
in the lake of fire for all eternity. Now we come to J, which is conclusion of today's lesson. But consider this. God is interested in all people. And even though there are billions of people in the world right now, over 3 billion people, God still knows and he's interested in every individual. Every living thing is important to God, even the sparrows. And though there are millions of sparrows in the world, the Bible tells us in Matthew that God knows when a sparrow dies. And in Psalm 50, verse 11, we read, God says, I know all the fowls of the mountains and the wild beasts of the field are mine. But we are so much more precious to God than birds or the beasts of the field. Psalm 139, verse 1 through 4 tells us, O Lord, you've examined my heart, and you know everything about me. You know when I sit down or stand up. You know my thoughts, even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. You know what I'm going to say even before I say it, Lord. So I want you to think about the vastness of the knowledge of God. I mean, this great, all-knowing, all-powerful God, He cares about everyone, even you and me. You see, God knows that we're studying His Word right now, and He wants us to believe in Him and believe His teaching that we're reading about. God wants us to listen, to believe, because He's not only interested in every individual, but He's going to judge every single person who refuses to believe in His Word. Now, some people think that they're just too insignificant for God to bother with them, but that's not true. Remember, just as we read from the Psalms, even the birds are important enough for God that He cares about them. He knows every single bird, all right? And how much more important are you and I than a bird? In fact, the Bible says that God even knows the hairs on our head. He's got the hairs on our head numbered. See, God cares about us. He wants us to believe in Him. But He also is righteous, and He's true. And he will judge every person who refuses to trust in him and to believe him. See, no person escapes God's concern. No sin escapes God's righteous judgment. God is the same today as he was in the day of Abraham and Lot and Sodom and Gomorrah. Well, now let's review the questions for today's lesson just to see if you got a handle on what we've been talking about because we really we covered a lot of territory we covered a lot of stuff today so let's just see if you remember everything that we talked about all right so here is question number one what did God tell Abraham after Lot left him God told Abraham that he would give him all the land of Canaan and God promised that Abraham's descendants would number more than the stars and God said that Abraham's descendants would go to live in another country, that they would be ill-treated for 400 years. But after that time, God would bring them back to the land of Canaan, which God had promised to Abraham. Two, what new names did God give to Abraham and Sarai? He gave them the name Abraham and Sarah. Three, why couldn't Abraham and Sarah have a child unless God performed a miracle? Well, because Sarah was unable to have a child. They were both too old. I mean, Abraham was now 100 years old, and Sarah was 90 years old. 4. Who created the first man and woman and gives life to every baby? God. Now, is there anything which God wants to do but cannot do? No. God can do everything that he wants to do. 6. Who knows the future of every person? Only God. 7. Did, not, did God know all about the wickedness of Sodom and Gomorrah? Yes. 8. If people ignore God, will he bypass them and not punish them? No. God is interested in all people, and he's going to judge every single person. 9. Why didn't God immediately punish the evil people of Sodom and Gomorrah? And why doesn't God immediately punish sinners now? And the answer is because God is loving, merciful, gracious, and patient. He gives people time to change their minds and to trust in him. And 10. Does God merely threaten but never punish sinners? No. Even though God is patient, he will eventually punish sinners. 11. Can anyone stop God from punishing people when he decides that they have had sufficient time to repent or change their minds? No. God is supreme. There is no one greater than he is. 12. And why did the Lord send his angels to rescue Lot, his wife, and his family? Because Lot agreed with God that he was a sinner and he trusted in God's promises to send the deliverer. And 13. Why did God turn Lot's wife into a pillar of salt? 
It's because she disobeyed the command of the Lord when he told them that they must not look back at the burning cities. Well, that's it for today's lesson. Next week, we're going to look at lesson number 18, which is God gave Isaac and God delivers Isaac from death. All right. So that's coming up next week. And again, you can go to our website, Foundation Study Week at Weebly.com and check out everything we have there and tell your family and friends about it as well. And I hope you uh, got something out of today's lesson that it's given you uh, much food for thought, a lot to think about and ponder and consider this week. Until next week, this is Pastor Dale saying, may the shalom peace be upon you and your family. I look forward to getting together with you again for our next lesson. Until then, have a great week.